Our Bible reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the Gospel, the good news, the really good news, the way John recorded it. It's chapter 20, the first 18 verses of the Gospel of John. This is what we read. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that a stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Jesus, so Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear congregation of the risen Christ, Years ago, when I was teaching English at Toronto District Christian High School, a chemistry teacher, taking some some phosphorus out of a container of water, accidentally dropped a piece of it on the classroom floor. The result? Spontaneous combustion. Not what he had planned to demonstrate, I'm sure. The fumes are highly toxic, so the classroom was evacuated, the fire department was called, And students who had had even a small chance of inhaling some of the fumes were bussed to a nearby hospital for observation and possible treatment. The next day, three Toronto newspapers found the event newsworthy enough to include it in that day's edition. But the difference in reporting was remarkable. The Globe and Mail carried a rather brief, quite objective, factual, one-paragraph account of the event. The Toronto Star focused more on the student reaction to the incident. They highlighted more of the emotional impact of the incident on some students, especially on those students who had been bused to the hospital. The Toronto Star was visually much more descriptive. 
It describes smoke billowing out the windows and the flames leaping out as well and spoke of students being at great risk of serious, if not fatal, consequences after inhaling the toxic fumes. So why am I telling you this? To ask you a question. Does the fact that there are three different reports mean that the actual event never happened? Well, you say, of course not. And so, does it mean that, that these reports were not all telling the truth? And we'd say, no, of course not. Clearly, different witnesses to one event see and recall different aspects of it, and they shape their stories according to their own purpose. And while all are true, none tell the whole story. And so, as it is with newspaper accounts of that one event, so it is with the four different gospel accounts of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And you would run into the same thing, I'm sure, when three different preachers will preach three different sermons on one scripture passage. Now, John's version of the resurrection of Jesus Christ seems somewhat restrained, even tame, compared to the other three Gospels. In the report that we read, there's no violent earthquake at resurrection time. There's no angel flashing down, lightning-like from heaven, scaring the soldiers senseless and rolling the stone away from the tomb and then casually sitting on it, telling the women of the resurrection and inviting them into the tomb to see for themselves. That's all according to the Gospel of Matthew. Nor in John are there terrified, bewildered women fleeing from the tomb in utter, utter fear, but commissioned to tell the disciples and Peter about the risen Christ, only to be faced with unbelieving disciples. That's Mark's gospel. And nor do we have worried women about who's going to roll that stone away from the tomb only to see it already removed, surprised to see the body of Jesus gone. But faced with two men in shining clothes with a wonderful question, and I think it must have had some heavenly laughter in it. Why look for the living among the dead? Followed by the powerful declaration, He is risen! jogging the women's memories, so they run to tell the amazing resurrection story only to have the disciples tell them they're full of nonsense. That's all in Luke's gospel. By the time John writes this gospel, all that has already been written and circulated. John does not have to repeat that. Instead, John makes the resurrection story intensely personal, focusing on one person and her post-resurrection experience. Mary Magdalene, the primary witness in this account. So, let's try to walk in her shoes for just a little while and see this, this post-burial this post world from her perspective. Kind of hard to do when we know this is Easter Sunday morning. But Mary started that Easter Sunday morning with a grieving, heavy, heavy heart. She had to go on with life without her Lord, without Jesus, who had restored her life and had cast out seven demons. And with Jesus, she was safe. But now, Jesus was dead. She had seen it day before yesterday. She stood by the cross. She saw him die and saw proof when the soldier speared his side. She saw the tomb in which Nicholas, Nicodemus and Joseph had placed him. He was dead. And she was going to the tomb to perform the usual burial rites with the spices she and the other women had brought with them. 
but she's too late. Someone has been there before her and taken the body. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him, she tells the disciples. Now John, the gospel writer here, is very careful to note that, that this empty tomb does not prod her memory. It doesn't quicken her faith. As far as Mary is concerned, there's only one possible explanation. Dead men are dead, and dead men stay dead. So someone must have taken his body. And that's exactly the kind of story that the Jewish leaders wanted people to believe. That's the kind of world Mary lived in, and we do too. A world of cause and effect, of life and of death, and death is the end. It's irreversible. Her logic, says one commentary, is right on target. Now, Peter and John, in a short insertion in the story, don't fare much better. They come to the tomb, and they find it's just as Mary had said. They see the evidence. Undisturbed grave clothes. No body. Peter and John do not see the angels. Peter leaves wandering. John sees and believes, but we wonder, believes what? Does he believe Mary's story? Does he believe the body is gone? Or does he actually believe the resurrection? Not so sure. One thing is sure, they don't seem to be filled with resurrection joy as they return to the other disciples. So why throw these two men into Mary's story? Well, maybe it's just to show that Mary wasn't just some hysterical woman who doesn't get what's going on because she's so bereft. There's just an irony at play here. Only the chief priests and the Pharisees who desperately wanted Jesus to be dead and to stay dead, they recalled Jesus talking about resurrection. The ones who desperately wanted Jesus dead were actually worried about his resurrection. But the ones who would have desperately wanted Jesus to be alive were sure that he was dead. And they acted like it. The disciples did not believe the women. Even after the women had encountered the angels and heard and repeated the angels' message. So Mary goes back. And although Peter and John did not see the angels at the gravesite, Mary on her return did. Maybe she was just checking to make sure. And there's no amazement on her part when she sees the angel. She's consumed with her grief and her mission. She hardly lets them speak. In answer to the question, why are you weeping? She right away says, they have taken my Lord away. And she turns away from them. She doesn't even give them time to explain and let, let her, and let them tell her the good news that Jesus is alive. Well, maybe they wouldn't have told her anyway. Maybe they already saw Jesus standing behind Mary before she did. And she turns and she sees Jesus, but does not recognize him. Tell me where they have put him, and I will get him, and I will take him away. She is so utterly consumed by a grief that will not lessen unless she can do for his body what is conventional and proper. He is dead, remember? And dead men always stay dead, right? Mary, with one word, with the calling of her name, Mary's closed world and ours is split wide open, turned upside down, inside out. The illogical, the impossible, the utterly unnatural has happened. He is alive. The one who was certified dead is alive. The old rules about what can happen and what is impossible, those rules don't count anymore. It's a new day. 
And it's a new day and a new way of relating to Jesus. So Mary can no longer cling to Jesus in the old way. Do not hold on to me, says Jesus. Do not cling to me. Don't hold me to the old customary ways. But go. Tell my disciples. Be an apostle to my apostles to be. And she does. Beginning with, I have seen the Lord. And this is reliable testimony. Not testimony from one who desperately wanted to see an alive Jesus. Just the opposite. It's reliable testimony from one who resisted the truth three times in a row. And this is why John makes so much of Mary's post-resurrection experience. This is John telling us that Mary's testimony is utterly reliable. Not the story of one who so desperately wanted to see the one she loved and cherished that she began to imagine that she saw him. That's the kind of story that was beginning to make the rounds in John's day. The story that Jesus did not really rise from the dead, just his spirit lived on, and his disciples imagined they saw him. In fact, that kind of story is still making the rounds. Easter, don't talk about resurrection. It's just a symbol of new life, new plant life, new crops, new flowers, new beginnings, blah, blah, blah. But the resurrection of Jesus is real and is, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, crucial to the gospel because without it, we are all dead and most to be pitied. So when Mary saw the real physical Jesus, not only was her world turned irrevocably inside out, but ours too. In light of the resurrection, all other powers are shadows, including the power of death. Christians, and especially persecuted Christians, they know that. These other powers may be able to kill, and we see too much of that every day in the news, but these powers cannot make alive. The resurrection of Jesus changes us. It releases us from the bondage to the inevitable. It releases us from, from living our lives in the shadow of death because we now live in the light of resurrected light. It releases us from cha chasing the empty dreams of the world. Dreams that have no life-changing power. We are citizens of a much better kingdom. But the resurrection of Jesus also shows that we cannot control him as Mary tried. We cannot claim Jesus to ourselves. We cannot define him, comprehend him. We cannot decide for ourselves what kind of Jesus we want. We cannot do that as a church. We cannot do that as individuals. Rather, Jesus claims us by calling every one of us by name just as he called Mary, and then sent her on with a message. It says in Isaiah, I have called you by name. You are mine. And as he calls each and every one of us, he explodes our carefully constructed sense of reality with a life that is just marvelous beyond description. And we have the privilege, we have the power to live that new kind of life. A life beyond the fear and power of death because the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, said Paul, is actually at work in you and in me. The risen Jesus knows you. He sees you, is with you in whatever circumstances you're in. He knows you by name because he's called you by name. He has claimed you for his own. Let that knowing and that Inside certainty characterize our relationships, our work, our principles, our ethics, our choices, even our entertainment, our political involvement, our approach to the poor, the helpless, the needy, the forgotten. Jesus said, 
that his sheep recognize his voice and they follow him. And he calls each sheep by name every morning. You've heard him, right? So live in the confidence that you have been called by name by none other than the risen Lord of all creation. Do not be afraid. I am with you always, says the risen and alive Jesus, who holds you in the palms of, your hand, of his hands. Indeed, he is risen. He is alive. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this incredible power that raised Jesus from the dead and that now works in each one of us to give us new resurrection life. Lord, help us to, to claim that certainty and to live by it every day, every moment. We pray this in the name of the risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.